Hello and welcome back to today's lesson. Today we're going to be looking at encoding and memory, picking up where we left off last time and moving into other ways we encode into our long-term memory. This includes some of our automatic processing and also some unique phenomenon that exist in memory. We'll finish with a quick look at the biology of memory and where these structures are in the brain. So just to review, we left off last time looking at the Atkinson and Schifrin three box model or information processing model of memory. And we really have been looking at the sensory memory and short term memory, the first two boxes. Today we're going to talk a little bit more about how we move information into that third box, the long term memory, in ways that are both automatic and effortful. But before we get there, I want to take a minute to talk a little bit more about that middle box the short-term memory or working memory box. The most common model is the Atkinson and Schifrin model, but there's also a second model that, that is used to describe working memory, and that is Badley's model of memory. And Badley's model of working memory breaks down short-term memory into additional structures. The phonological loop, the visual spatial sketch pad, and the central executive. And the way you can think about this model of working memory is that whatever you are thinking about right now is in your central executive. So if you are thinking about the words that I'm saying right now, and if I were to ask you to remember the next five words that I say, chances are you would be repeating those words in your head over and over again in order to remember them. So those words are on your central executive and the way that you are remembering them is through what is known as the phonological loop. So think about like phonological, um, hooked on phonics. If you remember what hooked on phonics were, it was a way to learn how to read. It was a way to learn words. And so if we're talking about something like words, the way to remember them in your working memory is to repeat them. So the phonological loop is just a fancy way of saying, we're gonna repeat this over and over again in order for us to keep it in our working memory. But where Badley kind of differed from Atkinson Schifrin's model is that they also focus on what types of images we also try and keep in our working memory. If I were to ask you to picture the front of the high school, for example, you might close your eyes to try and remember it. And so that information is not words, you can't repeat them. Instead, you have to visualize them. And so to keep something that is an image in your working memory, you make use of the visual spatial sketch pad. You imagine something in your mind's eye in order to keep that memory alive so you can move it into hopefully your long-term memory. So let's talk a little bit more about how we move that information into our long-term memory. How do we encode information? Last time we talked about the effortful processing that takes place. Some of the things that we have to really think about or focus on, like creating mnemonics or giving items meaning in order to move it into our long-term memory. But not everything requires so much effort. There's actually quite a lot that ends up in our long-term memory more automatically. And that's where we look at automatic processing. So automatic processing is just things that we remember without really trying. Sometimes this happens because of repetition. Although repetition or rote maintenance rehearsal typically only keeps things in our short-term memory, if used enough, it can move things into our long-term memory. My personal self-reference for this example is always the song, Call Me Maybe. And the reason is that my first year of teaching, we had a king and queen of the couch group that decided to play Call Me Maybe and only Call Me Maybe every single passing period throughout the school day. So five, six times a day, for weeks on end, I would hear that song playing in the hallway. After a while, it's going to get stuck in your memory. And to this day, I can still remember the lyrics to Call Me Maybe, even though I've never actively tried to remember it. So that is automatic processing. With very little effort, it is something that's moved into my memory. The other ways that we move things into our long-term memory automatically are known as space, time, and frequency. And space is really talking about where things are in space. If you have ever forgotten something at home, say your lunch or 
your computer and you can remember exactly where you left it. You close your eyes and you can visualize it on your kitchen counter or at your desk in your bedroom. That is automatic space processing. You didn't have to do anything to remember it. In fact, if you remembered it, you probably wouldn't have forgotten it, forgotten it in the first place, but it is something that you can remember pretty automatically. The time processing is looking at sequence. So again, let's pretend that you lost an item, maybe your computer in one of your classes, but you don't remember which one. Without really thinking about it, you can retrace your steps from earlier in the day because we naturally remember the sequence of events. So we can go backwards from place to place in the correct order, even though we never consciously tried to remember the order of events that took place earlier that day. And then frequency is how many times. So going back to the song, for example, if you were to turn on the radio and hear a song three times in one day, you might not have consciously been counting the first or second time you heard that song, but by the third time you heard that song, you could probably say, change the station, I've heard this song three times already, because you have automatically processed that information. So space, time, and frequency are three ways that we encode pretty automatically that doesn't require a lot of effort. And as we mentioned before, effortful processing just means we've actually put some time and energy into moving information into our long-term memory. So things like meaning, visualizing, and mentally organizing. There are other ways we can move information into our long-term memory using effortful processing, and that does include, as I mentioned, maintenance rehearsal. It takes a very long time, but you could repeat something enough times in order to move it into your long-term memory. It's not the most effective and should really only be used for keeping something in your short-term memory. We also have elaborative rehearsal. And elaborative rehearsal means that we are deeply thinking about information. This goes along with what's known as the levels of processing theory that essentially says the more different ways you look at information, the more likely you are to remember it. So if you think about a vocab term and you come up with a self-reference to help you remember it, but you also come up with a mnemonic and you also come up with a picture to go along with it, and you also come up with your own example of it. The more different ways you look at the same piece of information, the deeper the level of processing and the more likely that information is going to be stored in your long-term memory for an extended period of time. We also have some pretty excellent phenomena that happen when it comes to what ends up in our memory and what does not. The serial position effect shows us that when we are remembering items from a list, we have a tendency to remember the first and last things more so than the items in the middle. And we might wonder, why is that? Well, we remember the first things in a list because when we are reading down the list, we are more likely to go from the top to the bottom and then back to the top again and over and over again as we're trying to remember a large amount of information. So the first things we remember, the primacy effect, stay in our brain because of maintenance rehearsal, because we're exposed to the first things in the, in the list the most. We also remember the last things in the list because of the recency effect, because it was often the last thing we saw. So the first things because of repetition and the last things because it's most recent make up the serial position effect to explain why we typically remember the first and last things on a list. Some other really great phenomena that we have seen in memory in psychology include the next in line effect, where we often forget information that was presented right before we speak. So if you think about giving a presentation and someone else is giving a presentation right before you, you might not be thinking about what that person is saying because when you know you're up next, all you're really thinking about is what you're going to say. And because of that, the information that's being presented is not being encoded in your memory. We see this often when people are introducing themselves and going around the room. Once everyone is done, you can often not remember the person sitting directly next to you because as they were introducing themselves, you were thinking about your own introduction. And one of my personal favorite phenomena when it comes to memory is the von Restorf effect. And I love this because the name helps us to remember what it is. 
The von Restorff effect says that typically we remember things that are unique or different. I like to think of it as the Sesame Street example. If you remember the song, one of these things just doesn't belong here. It helps us to point out and recognize the one thing that doesn't fit. And this is something that our brain does very automatically. If something is unique or different, it sticks out in our mind and therefore is likely to be moved into our long-term memory. So let's go ahead and finish up with the biology of memory. What parts of the brain are responsible for memory and what do they do? There's really two major brain parts that are responsible for memory. The first being the hippocampus. And as we learned in the last video, hippos have a good memory on campus. So we can remember that the hippocampus is responsible for a lot of our memories. But what the hippocampus really does is it helps us remember explicit memories or declarative memories. This is where all of the facts and data, general knowledge, uh, we remember what things are because of our hippocampus. Semantic encoding takes place in our hippocampus. But if you were to damage your hippocampus, you might still be able to walk and talk and play an instrument and shoot a basketball. And you might be wondering, if I damage my hippocampus, why can I still remember how to do all of these things? And that's because how to do things, which is our implicit or procedural memories, are stored in our cerebellum. So there are two separate areas of our brain responsible for storing memories. Our hippocampus stores the what, the facts, the knowledge, and the cerebellum stores the activities, the actions, and the movement. And so when we damage one, it does not necessarily mean we lose all memory of how to function as a human being. And if we go even deeper into the brain and look at the smallest cells, the neurons, we can even see the traces of memory there. Long-term potentiation, or LTP, tells us that the more we do things, the stronger the neural connections get inside of our brain that make memory faster and easier. So if you think about it, if you learn something new, a new neural connection is formed. And then the more you use it, the more you practice with it, the stronger and stronger that connection becomes until it becomes so ingrained that it becomes automatic. You can think about this with procedural memories, like playing a sport, people who say practice makes perfect, and muscle memory. The more you do something over and over again, the stronger those neural connections become to make that action permanent. So then you don't have to think about that process as much the next time you do it. It will happen automatically. Same thing happens when you study and when you use your explicit or declarative memories. So the more you work with information, and this is really explaining that levels of processing theory at a neurological level. The more you use that information, the deeper you process it, the stronger the connections in your brain become, and therefore you'll remember more information. What's amazing about the brain is that nothing is static, that every time you learn something new, a change in your brain is taking place. And so even if you think right now, I don't have a good memory, the more you practice and the more you use it, the stronger those connections become, your brain can actually change and you can become more effective with your memory. The last thing we'll talk about with the biology of memory is the nervous system. And in the past, we talked about flashbulb memories and how we remember those best and worst moments of our life. And the question is, why does that happen? The answer is really due to stress hormones. When we are in an exciting situation, stress hormones are released throughout our body and they alert our brain to something important happening. And it sort of alerts our mind to say, pay attention to this. This is really important for us to remember. And that's part of the reason why flashbulb memories are so vivid in our minds. It does unfortunately have some limitations though. Too much stress placed on the brain can actually block our memories. And that's why sometimes when a person experiences prolonged stress or a very traumatic event, might not have the full memory of the event afterwards. So stress can help our brain, but it can also harm our brain. And there are so many different parts of our brain that are responsible for remembering, and we can change those areas all the time. We'll go ahead and stop there for today. 
Next time we come together, we'll go ahead and talk about how we retrieve that information that is now stored in our long-term memory. Thanks for watching, and remember, be kind to your mind.